In the name of God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, I bring you this word today. Amen. I'm a big fan of the prophet Micah. Not just because it's short and sweet and to the point, but because of this passage from chapter 4 that Hazel shared with us. The prophet speaking to a people without hope, as prophets often do, suggests that there will be a time when people will come to their senses, when people will claim hope, when people will recognize the good that God offers. Some people, anyhow. The mountain of the Lord's house will become the most popular destination on the planet, metaphorically speaking. And people will be eager to learn the ways of the God of Jacob. And this instruction that comes from the mouth of the Lord will be mostly welcome by many nations, many peoples. And best of all, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. We will sit in our gardens of peace, each under their own vine and fig tree. This is the stuff that dreams are made of. Certainly the stuff of our dreams. For who doesn't want an end to violence? Who doesn't want an end to the warring madness that all of us have known in some form or another our whole lives? Who doesn't desire a peaceable kingdom? Which of us would prefer anxiety to the lovely pastoral images of each sitting under their own tree? with no one, no one to make them afraid. This comes from the prophet as from the mouth of God. And we have contained it within Scripture and called it holy. And therefore it's trustworthy. It's a promise we can count on. A a very reasonable expectation and representation of the future that God has promised us. Right? And even now I read that and say, where is it? When? This text is nearly 3,000 years old. What are you waiting for, God? Any of you fans of ancient mythology? You like the stories of Heracles and Perseus and Theseus and Odysseus and all of, the, all of that lot? I, I live for that stuff. When I was a kid and I get all of it, I can even now in fiction, adaptations and things like that. And those stories and our affinity for them remind me that even now, even in a Christian West, we cling to many mistaken ideas and expectations about divinity. These are as old as time. These stories go back beyond Scripture. Most ancient civilizations had a God for every occasion, And regionally, you prayed to your favorite God for your favorite thing, right? And as cultures got more sophisticated, like the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians, they they began to put names and faces to those 
particular gods, and they raised some above others. And over time, the goddess of the hunt and the god of the harvest were mingled and merged. The gods of childbirth became indistinguishable from the gods of war. There were hierarchies in the divinity, a social order, major gods and minor gods that interacted only in certain ways and only had certain effects. And all of them were able to interact with humans at will, and those interactions could have lasting effect on the society of humans. All of those ideas inform our notions of who God is and what God can do. Still, we, we don't really stray too far from those ancient ideas when, in the midst of a drought, we stand in our fields and pray for rain. Or when we stand at the altar at an outdoor wedding and pray for sunshine. we still fall into the trap of wanting, needing the creator of the universe to be more like those ancient gods of everything who would come at our command and answer us if we did the right things. These were divinities who fought for human attention and we were happy to give it. But they also used humanity like poker chips in some cosmic card game. They didn't care about what happened to us. That's the difference. That's the distinction that we make when we think about God. But we're still guilty of reading the Old Testament through this lens of the ancient divinity system. Because we are sure, prove me wrong, we are sure that if we are faithful enough or righteous enough or otherwise obedient enough, that God will fix the world for us, that God will bless us, that God will grant us the peace we long for if only, if only we do everything right. Prove me wrong. In part, that's what we hear when we read Micah chapter 4. It's the hope of the prophet that the people will come to their senses, they will honor God, and all will be well. And that's not entirely wrong. It's not a bad idea to hope for that. But it's not the whole story. We are so fiercely devoted in the Christian world to this notion that God has a plan and that we can convince God to implement that plan by our behavior, through our prayers, because of our deep devotion. We pray for God's peace. We sing about God's peace. We stake our institutional reputations on the coming of God's peaceable kingdom and we stand in our righteousness and demand that it happen soon, God, soon. And we're wrong. We're just wrong. Jesus even tells us we're wrong. Not in so many words. Jesus is far kinder than I. He never says outright, God isn't like that. Come to your senses. Pull yourselves together. Neither does he say God will turn on you if you don't toe the line or follow the rules. Jesus' venom is saved for those who would hold the rules over people's heads as a, as a threat. Jesus, who knows better than anyone the true character of God and the true nature of God, only really hints at what God will or will not do. And in the end, he winds up saying stuff like, only God knows. 
It's all very cryptic, coming from the mouth of Jesus. But Jesus does tell us about how to live faithfully within our own reality, within this horror and anxiety and terror that surrounds us daily. And he also tells us how to live faithfully toward the reality that only God knows. Consider Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 10. Especially the bit that Dick read out for us today. This is part of that story, you'll remember, when Jesus is sending his disciples out two by two to preach and heal. He sends them with just what they have on them, tells them not to linger if their peace doesn't return to them. And he sends them out with words that are just barely hopeful. I send you as sheep among the wolves. Oh, thanks, Lord. Appreciate that. Good job. Don't let your guard down. Be shrewd as snakes and mild as doves. In other words, you're going out into the world to preach the good news. Beware, says Jesus. Beware. It's not that he doesn't offer hope to them. What he doesn't offer is false hope. He offers reality. He reminds his disciples and us, by extension, that the promotion of the common good, which is our call as his disciples, the promotion of equality before God, of kindness and compassion between and amongst humans as a model for what God's kingdom looks like is a very hard pill to swallow for anyone and everyone who benefits from the kingdom of me first or from the notion of everyone for themselves that our culture has so happily embraced. You are going out with a message that will stop these people in their tracks and they're not going to be happy about it. God's kingdom doesn't come because you wish it to come. And it doesn't even come because you embody it as Jesus did. It is always a struggle. Governments populated by powerful people who promise to do their best, are time and time again corrupted by the notion of their own power. And in no time at all, their best means best for them and their friends. That's not a new phenomenon. That didn't happen four years ago or 40 years ago. It happened 4,000 years ago, and it has always been so. Jesus' instruction to preach, heal, and proclaim the commonwealth of grace puts those of us who would follow Jesus at odds with the leaders and the powerful people of our time. People who will do nearly anything to maintain the system from which they benefit. And of course, this will put brother against brother and father against son, and the children will rise up against their parents. Chaos, that sounds like. Jesus says, this is how it is. You don't believe me? Then offer into an online forum or, God forbid, a coffee shop line the notion that there might be another way to live that there might be a better way to treat one another. And then stand back for the name calling will begin. And the accusations. And you can be sure the people who accuse you strongest are the people whose power is threatened by the notion that all of us are equal in God's eyes. 
Jesus knows about God's promised peace. Jesus embodied God's promised peace, and he brought it to the people who least expected it. But he also knows that that won't just happen because we believe it should. The peace comes, as Micah suggested it would, when the people cannot stomach the ordinary ways of the world and shake their heads and come to their senses and run toward God for instruction in another way, in a better way, in, in God's way. When I first started to show an interest in the church in high school, I was in a Baptist congregation in my hometown, lovely people, many of whom I still hold great fondness for and still am in contact with. And their testimonies offered at various times used to make me very concerned that I hadn't suffered enough to be able to call myself a follower of Jesus. Because their stories were all about, I got kicked and knocked down, and now I'm up again because of Jesus, and nothing, nothing is wrong anymore. Now, I, I learned over time that that's not true. Bad stuff continues to happen to those gloriously wonderful people. They aren't exempt from the wear and tear of everyday life. Bad stuff happens all the time, every day. Families tear themselves apart for no good reason. Governments and religious authorities react badly when you try and live according to Jesus' way of compassionate concern and loving kindness. Because even now, 2,000 years after the fact, Jesus' way defies the usual order of things. It's upsetting. When we answer only to the spirit of love, then the spirit of the world is threatened. And the spirit of the world, I guarantee you, will lash out. And in case you didn't know, the spirit of the world is capable of great atrocity. And the only way you wouldn't know that is if you haven't read a paper or watch the news in your life. Jesus says, this is what you're up against. But God, in love, is there with you. God, in love, will see you through. Not because you followed the rules in a way that pleased God, even Micah knew that. God will see you through, and because of what people see in you, they will come running to God for instruction. This is Micah again. They will want to know what is this new way that is so different and so liberating and so generous and so gracious. So the question is not, have we followed the rules in such and such a way so that God will smile on us? No. The question, as Jesus frames it, is, are you willing to display your God-given humanity even when the chips are down? Because trust me, eventually, inevitably, the chips are down. They're going to fall. And we are assured that God is already there to support us, to sustain us when the bad stuff happens. Not to magically put it right, but to affirm in us the words and actions that will help us together begin to put things close to right, to move the spirit a little closer to wide acceptance. 
the perfection that we see sometimes in the prophets and imagine that we see in the gospel. All under our own trees in perfect peace with no more fear and every eye dried of tears. It's a lovely dream, but it's just a dream. The real miracle of God's peaceable kingdom is that we can experience it in the midst of our worst days and at the height of our anxiety and in spite of our arrogance and ignorance. The peaceable kingdom is that gift of surprising grace, the calm at the eye of the storm that doesn't disperse the storm. The peaceable kingdom is found in the steady and constant presence of God when the world seems to have abandoned all pretense of compassion and cooperation. That kingdom, Jesus said more than once, is very near to you, as close as your next breath. May we be given the means to recognize that peace when it draws near. May it come quickly, driven by our love of God and one another. Soon may it be so. Amen.